I'm Steve Backshaw, and you're listening to the Aussie Wildlife Show. All right, guys, welcome to the Aussie Wildlife Show. Adrian here, and I'm here, of course, with Steve. Good day, guys. And we're very lucky today to have with us Dr. Wayne Boardman. And Wayne is a wildlife vet um, and, and friend and neighbour. Welcome, Wayne. Hi, guys. N- nice to be here. Mate, thanks for coming on. Um, been meaning to get you on for a long time, actually. Um, known you for a number of years. You're, uh, you work with the vet students at, uh, at Roseworthy here, and uh, they're lucky because they get to work with the reptiles, and that's your influence there that um, thinks that these guys, they're going to become vets. They get to see cats, dogs, rabbits, cows. They should have reptiles as part of their course too. Well, they should have any sort of wildlife, really, and so it was fantastic when I decided to go and work at the, the new vet school that I had the opportunity to set up a course for our new vet students and it was I had sort of a great opportunity to organise a course how I saw fit and uh, thought it would be great to have them anaesthetising birds, reptiles, um, snakes, you know, a whole, whole variety of different species because not many places in Australia get an opportunity to for students to actually anaesthetise and do health checks on these animals because they're going to see them when they're out in practice so it's, I thought it was a really good idea to give them that opportunity Do you ever get students that don't want to touch snakes? We did <laughs> yeah, We have had them Yeah, that's very phobic and kind of interesting, you know, having a, a vet student that is actually doesn't like certain uh, animals and I kind of had a bit of a difficulty coming to terms with it but then realised that it was real phobia but we, we encouraged her, she st- stood in the background she didn't need to take part, we encouraged her and we got actually to touch a snake and then she came with me to South Africa, when we did, I take students to South Africa once a year and she touched another snake over there so she broke down the barriers a little bit That's brilliant it, It's such a broad subject isn't it because I mean if you're a doctor you work with people I mean, I know that the human body is complicated, but you're working with birds, mammals, reptiles, you know, wildlife. Um, you know, do people come into it wanting to work with cats and dogs? Do you get many people that want to work with exotic animals? And well, there's actually, we do a survey. It actually, it turned out of the blue that we did this survey. So the epidemiologist does a survey on the third year students and says, you know, what do you want to do when you finish vet school, which is a six year course, and you know about 20 to 25 percent of them each year have always said they want to work with wildlife which there's not many opportunities but over a period of time um you know perhaps their interest in that area wanes a little bit but certainly you know there's a lot that i you know i take students to south africa as i mentioned and and there's certain students that are really keen uh, on doing wildlife and we've got one um vet graduate now who's worked doing a zoo Um, and wildlife pathology residency in Cornell University and she was always really keen in wildlife and we've got another uh, student who's working at Massey doing a wildlife residency over there so so there are opportunities you have to be uh, keen to move forward and uh, you know move countries often but um, you know there's there's certainly an interest in that area and so what made you become a wildlife vet, just above and beyond, you know, the typical vets that we take our cats and dogs to? It's funny, really. I, I, uh, I'd always had a a real interest in in zoology, uh, and I was really going to be a zoologist when I was uh, at school. But uh, I met a, a a chap who used to live nearby, and uh, he said, "Really, you need to think of having a vocational uh, uh, degree." And I've been thinking about doing vet degree, and he said, "You know, why don't you go and push it?" And I, it's hard to get into vet school, and anyway, I decided to to go for it. But I'd always had this real interest. Used to do a lot of bird watching, mammal watching. Used to listen, you know, watch the David Attenborough um, documentaries and so on. Uh, and then, so I got, I got into vet school uh, ultimately, and then it was a great opportunity. Not in those days, not many people had that much of an interest in zoo stuff but I we got free free access to London Zoo so I used to go into London Zoo as a student on a regular basis and kind of loved all the animals there and then saw practice uh, at the zoo and one of the and and the the two weeks I saw practice as a so when you you need to do some practical training uh, as a 
vet student and I spent a bit of time at London Zoo uh, and during that period we anaesthetised a giant panda we anaesthetised an elephant called Poli Poli uh, which was an elephant that was uh, was the form was started the formation of the Born Free Foundation um, we operated on a variety of different animals we did lots of post-mortems we, we anaesthetised a zebra that we were taking embryos out and taking them up to Cambridge to put into horses to see whether the embryo transfer could work you know early days of that sort of thing and I was just a student you know watching this you know I injected my first elephant when I was a student <laughs> thought that this is a fantastic fantastic uh, how, how big is the needle they use for an elephant <laughs> <laughs> big one big big thick skin they've got and then well, then when I was a, a vet student we had the opportunity to go and do research in Kenya so we the, the Royal Vet College where I went uh, had a tradition uh, every two years of having students going and doing a research project overseas, We're going back from the 60s. So this was in, in the 80s and we got an opportunity to go to Kenya and we lived and worked on a um, game reserve outside uh, Nairobi and we did a nutritional study on all the wildlife that were uh, the, on that property and stayed there. So you know, observational mostly, but took samples, did some laboratory work. We did some work at the snake park. Uh, uh, a group went up to do some work up in Lake Tukana. Uh, we, we stayed in the base near Nairobi, but that what a great, great experience. And that was really a life-changing experience to, to do that as a student and then go and see practice at London Zoo. So that gave me a great opportunity, well, a, a great feeling that's what I wanted to do in the future. But then, you know, the opportunities are few and far between. So um, it, was, it wasn't until I moved to New Zealand where I started to work at a, in practice, um, but nearby in a wonderful little town called Otrohonga in the, in the King Country, um, they had a little Kiwi house which was the first uh, an original Kiwi house in New Zealand. So local pharmacist, uh, the local vet, passionate about wildlife, set up this little Kiwi house um, and had native birds in there and sort of learned how to look after injured Kiwi that would come in that had gin traps, you know, injuries and all that sort of thing. And so I started to do that, that work for that property. Uh, and... and s- suddenly out of the blue there was a job that was advertised at Auckland Zoo to for a vet and so I thought might as well apply for it I haven't got a huge amount of experience but uh, you know I did my put my best foot forward a handwritten application <laughs> which you know today is just ridiculous but I didn't have access to a com- uh, well a com- the computers weren't invented uh, and I did write neater than doctors did <laughs> <laughs> well, I did. Yeah, I, I, was, I, was, I was very neat in those days, and uh, and so I yeah, didn't really have access to a typewriter. So anyway, I hand, handwritten, didn't hear anything for months, and then they contacted me and said, "Would you like to come up for an interview?" We've interviewed a few people; none of them were suitable. <laughs> so we we wondered whether you might be suitable. So I went up for an interview and and got the job. So that was back in. 1989 when I started working as the first full-time zoo vet in New Zealand uh, at uh, Auckland Zoo. Almost 30 years. Exactly. Yeah, I've been working with zoo, wildlife, uh, species ever since, you know, and that's my passion. And that and that passion has seen you travel around the world, getting involved with with various animals. I mean, especially today, with the, it's, everyone knows about the conservation issues um, with wildlife disappearing, so many threatened species, and it's you're in a position where you can actually make a difference. Well, that was my p- plan, and I hope I've contributed some some you know in some small way. Certainly, when I first started working at Auckland Zoo, there was. It was a bit of a challenge getting going and there was not a lot of support from some staff and, you know, I was kind of mixed about whether I was going to continue or, or, or go back into practice, you know, but then, you know, I kind of had an epiphany at one stage a couple of years in and said, this, oh, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I'm not going to earn much money. I'm not going to have my own practice, you know, big deal, uh, but I'm going to 
be so it was about conservation really and I wanted to contribute to conservation as much as I possibly can so you know it, it took took me back to when I was a, a kid thinking you know want, wanted to do zoology wanted to be a, a naturalist you know uh, talk about animals and things like that and then this gave me the opportunity that I could combine being a veterinarian and uh, working with wildlife and for conservation yeah because a lot of people don't realize that i mean they, they think of zoos and they think of um, cleaning animal enclosures chopping up food and making money out of keeping animals in prisons you know that's the negative slant on a zoo but i mean particularly these days there's a whole heap of conservation activities happening behind the scenes with zoos it's like I, and it's analogous to an iceberg where the, the biggest part of it's underneath the water the and the bits that people don't see oh and you know having having worked at Auckland Zoo which developed lots of conservation programs do you know fantastic work I've got the most amazing zoo now get huge visitation gets awards uh, to then going working at Perth Zoo which uh, they were involved in all sorts of uh, reintroduction programs numbats chudich uh, little animals called dibblers western swamp turtles all these animals that uh, you know were very endangered in west australia and were being released through the activities of perth zoo working with other people and then you know adelaide and monato zoo where i used to work as well you know they just do fantastic work particularly at monato zoo behind the scenes with you know mainland tamil wallaby reintroduction black flank rock wallaby or waru and uh, you know, bilbies, betongs, you know, all sorts of uh, fantastic programs that they've been involved in. And it's great to be able to contribute uh, in some way to some of those programs. And a lot of animals that you just named then, like dibblers and warriors, there's they're, they're some fun things for you to go home and Google. Um, <laughs> people are with me. <laughs> go home and Google. Can I find out now what a dibbler is? Please. <laughs> a, a dibbler is a little... Uh, uh, which is called parantichinus, so it's like like a, an antichinus, which is a uh, a small marsupial mouse right. um, that was is particularly endangered over in West Australia. West Australia always has some al- interesting alternative names to, you know, Western quail or chudich, uh, mm. dibbler or parantichinus. So they always have these kind of interesting names over there. Um, so I hope that. Answers that clears it to up. Thank yeah. you. They call yeah. southern brown bandicoots quenders. They do. They do. <laughs> and uh, you know, burrowing betongs are booties, and, they do, yeah. and <laughs> brush-tailed betongs are woilies. Woilies, yeah. you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> and the dibbler's related to the Tassie devil, which is odd. Oh, yeah, one yeah. of those guys. I've never seen a dibbler. Yeah, no, it's a it's a, a carnivorous uh, marsupial. Yeah. And I know waru only because we saw them the other day. The, yes, the, the yes. W- we saw... Um, what's Maureen. Name? Maureen. Maureen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah amazing. I, I, I take the students to, uh, to Monato um, in the first semester and we get to see Maureen. And we could we tell a story around Maureen because, you know, I was involved in with, with some of the guys at the zoo, Dave Taggart, Ian Smith, and a bunch of guys from the Department of Environment um, where we went up to the APY lands up in the northwest of South Australia and caught some of these uh, black flank wall- rock wallabies which are called waru up there and then we would um, we'd do health checks on them so I would take all my gear up up into an, a, a little area called uh, Kalka which is next to Piplajara which is right on the furth- furthest tip uh, Surveyor, George, uh, Surveyor General's Corner uh, r- r- really close to um, uh, West Australia, and there's just a small pocket of black flag rock wallabies in that area, and these others on the eastern parts of the AP Wildlands. So, so it was my job to go and look after, look well, look for these animals, and we set up traps, and we take all the gear, and we have a, a rock which was my little table where we'd anaesthetise and do health checks on them, and so on. And then the aim was to take some of the pouch young from those uh, females take take it from those females and then fly it down in a little incubator so this fancy little incubator was a, uh, a Tupperware container <laughs> with a moist, a moist uh, container so um, swabs with saline in and you just had to keep it between 
18 and 25 degrees. So what they found out when you take a poaching from the pouch of a female is that if you have the temperature too high, they use too much of their energy very quickly. So you have to keep them sl slightly cooler and they can la live for eight, nine hours outside the pouch. So these are, you know, three, four centimetre big um, uh, pouch. Them. They'd be pink. Oh, very, very pink, you yeah. know, ch like translucent. You know, you can see the milk going down and yeah. you can see the liver and all sorts. So then we would take them down. T so we fly them down from the west parts of the AP Wirelands down to Murray Bridge Airport, get go to the zoo and then put them in the pouch of a yellow-footed rock wallaby. And so the population built up over years uh, to the extent now that they've been released back up into that area. That's amazing. That's awesome, yeah. It is amazing, isn't it? And like you were saying to us earlier, that the, by taking that baby, the female has a an embryo in diapause that will then spark into development? Absolutely. So so we, we take that one away, but just right behind another 20 odd days is another one that's born and, and goes up into that pouch and fills that place and that's a magical thing about embryonic di diapause and the fact that you know Dave Taggart developed this kind of technique to try and increase the numbers of animals uh, well, the numbers of endangered species through using this cross fostering technique So next time you visit a zoo guys that's some of the things that are happening behind the scenes. Yeah, that's just that's just one of the the, the things. You know, when you think about uh, London Zoo, where I used to work, um, they have a whole international uh, research organisation based around conservation, and they have conservation programmes all around the world as well. So, so the zoos, London Zoo and Whipsnade Zoo, are just part of the whole organisation of the Zoological Society of London uh, and they have the Institute of Zoology which is part of the Zoological Society of London that is doing enormous amount of uh, you know, fantastic work all around the world. Now, you mentioned that you, you lived in New Zealand. You were talking to me earlier today about, the, I can't remember the name of that big giant, the, the world's biggest three kilogram parrot yeah <laughs> yeah that's right it's um we were very very lucky to work with the kakapo um a, a extraordinary uh, beautiful bird uh a sort of olive kind of green color about three kilos uh flightless so it, it was you know adapted to new zealand uh situation not didn't have any predators so it, it could do well and then we introduced all sorts of cats in particular but stoats and weasels to New Zealand and that decimated their population so the chicks there was no recruitment these animals are very long lived 50 60 years perhaps breed once every four years so the the chances of recruitment in that situation where you've got cats and you've got other predators then the, there was no chance really of, of that species recovering so back in the early 90s at uh, Auckland Zoo um, they were looking at how to try and uh, help the species and so we were asked um, through the curator primarily to hand raise a bunch of kia and kaka which are you know New Zealand species of parrot and they, they fly of course but relatively similar but you know quite different in lots of other respects but the idea was to try and get some skills in hand raising the, these uh, birds before they would bring a kakapo chick to the zoo which they did and um, we we initial attempt wasn't particularly successful but the second attempt was successful and we we hand raised one uh, that was released back into the wild and that was you know we learned a lot about that so there's about 51 animals at that time so this was the 52nd you know so it was anywhere that's in the wild that's everywhere completely yeah. in the, and the only place um is new zealand where they are so they used to live down uh, on stewart island and in the fjordland in particular but they were very very common uh, birds all over new zealand until you know, European uh, settlement 
And then they got to the sort of stage where they had to put them on specific islands and get rid of a lot of the um, predators. So the, the, the rats in particular, uh, the, the Polynesian rat, the curie, um, and certainly there would not be very few cats on these uh, places. But So one of the areas that they put the kakapo on to the island, uh, one particular island was Little Barrier Island, which was just off the coast from Auckland. And one day um, I got called upon, we've got an injured kakapo, can you come over to the island? Uh, well, yeah, sure, how do you... How do you uh, want me to get over there? Because it's it's not a it's not an easy access. And, oh, we'll fly you by helicopter. So, oh, that sounds pretty good, really. <laughs> so I got flown over by helicopter, and on more than one occasion, to Little Barrier Island to check on the, uh, one of the kakapo. One of these kakapo had a harness on, a tracking uh, device to try and find it, and it had injured it. So they wanted me uh, to check it, uh, and we had to go. Like over three days, very high mounting up and down until we could actually find it and you know, manage to treat it. It was the injuries weren't too too excessive, um, and it was it was all hunky dory and and uh, the kakapo were there on that island to try and help save them. But and they were being uh, given provision, the provision fed. So the, these these kakapo are extraordinary in the fact that around about January, February, the males boom. So they've got this incredible booming sound, and they're, they're a lek breeder. So they they go up into this track and bowl system, and then they just stand there and boom, boom, like all night long, and to attract a female, and. You know, they lose a lot of energy doing this, and then the female, you know, when she feels like it, like it, uh, goes up there. Mating occurs, and they might produce one or two eggs if you're lucky, and they might do this once every four years. So there, there are species that weren't, you know, designed to cope with the vagaries of introduced uh, predators. Um, did very well otherwise but in those sort of situations you know they were just being hammered so um, they found ultimately on Little Barrier Island that it probably wasn't the best kind of environment so they used to put they put some um, birds on the Marlborough Sounds in the North Island, uh, sorry the north of the South Island and then they also put some on Codfish Island uh, which is at the bottom end of the South Island not far from Stewart Island and um, and they've subsequently bred really very well now, and but they've been supported. You know, the, if you if you go and look at kakapo online and, and look at the what the Department of Conservation do to try and help support those animals, and uh, you know sometimes they'll got cameras on nests and they might take them away as the eggs wet until they've hatched, and then they put them back in and then. They're keeping an eye on them very, very closely. And on those islands, they're free of the predators, which is fantastic. Um, but they're still very protective. And now there's about 150. So I was I was incredibly privileged to be able to work with a charismatic parrot like that. But there's, I think, uh, Stephen Fry has, has and Mark Cowardine, uh, on the Last Chance to See uh, documentary that they did, uh, Mark Cowardine was... Uh, was mated, uh, his head was mated by a male kakapo. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and got lots of scratches. So, he, <laughs> so when, when they've uh, been booming for a while and they're in peak condition, then they'll, uh, they'll even make people's heads. <laughs> Nothing comes of that, though. No, unfortunately. No. No. <laughs> New Zealand's one of the only other places besides Australia that I can think of that never had cats. Um, but Australia had lots of mammals. Uh, native predators like quolls that we mentioned um, but New Zealand didn't even have them so those birds when the predators come over um, they would have been they would have oh, stood a chance com- completely naive a lot of them were uh, flightless birds you know some of them were weak flyers you know we worked with uh, takahe so that's like a huge uh, sw- purple swamp hen you know um, they they were found in 19, rediscovered in I think 1947 by a, a chap called Dr. Orbell, uh, who 
used to think they were still here in, in the Murchison Mountains, so really close to Tiano down the southwest part of uh, New Zealand, really rugged mountains, and he used to go looking for them. Actually, you know, out of the blue, thought to be extinct, he found one. And uh, cryptozoology. Yeah, well, yeah, without the crypto bit, <laughs> actually finding them. And, um, and so, you know, they really discovered that there was a few more there. And, you know, back in 1997, we, we went to do health checks on those uh, ca- uh, takahe that were on the Murchison Mountains. So we'd fly in by helicopter we'd have a dog that would be on the skids of the uh, helicopter in a little kennel. So, it was a, so we had a, a, a Takahe dog that would, could smell out where the birds were because the tussocks are huge and massive and you really can't find the, the bird. So you need a dog to be able to smell it out. So once you knew it was in a particular area, you could then go and uh, catch it, yeah, jump on it. Big birds, you know, two or three kilos, big bills, take your finger off. So you'd have to, have to be careful how you, you manage them. Um, but to see this uh, uh, Springer Spaniel, as it was, in action, you know, pointing into this huge tussock and saying, there's a takahe in there, there's a takahe in there, and we'd go in, grab it, and we were, we were doing health checks on them because uh, we were concerned about a particular uh, bacteria that might have... Uh, been uh, might have caused a problem with some of the captive breeding at Burwood Bush uh, on the mainland. Well, uh, on the sorry, not not so much the mainland, but on the land uh, adjacent to Tiano, away from the mountains. What? What? Why has uh, New Zealand got so many flightless birds? Because they had no predators to run away from. And that was all it was. So they've just yeah. evolved. Yeah. yeah, like like you think about the moa. Mm. The, there yeah. were several species of moa, you know. Um, I think there's maybe up to about a dozen species, and they they're all flightless ratites, like the kiwi. So the kiwi is the one that kind of survived. The only living one, isn't it? Yeah, re, re, in essence, yeah. And um, you know, all those others were eaten out of existence. The other moas, and the moas were, yeah, eight, ten feet tall. I've, big, I've big heard they're like as big as a young giraffe. Some of them, like three, three oh, meters. Yeah, yeah, huge, huge animals. And you know, w- w- what a tragedy we didn't get to see it. The harst eagle, the the biggest eagle in the world. You know, possibly. You know, I might be telling a, a porky here, but about four or five meter uh, wingspan. You know, that would take out uh, mowers as well. You know, so and they disappeared. Right? So there's been a lot of animals that have kind of disappeared. So. So some of it has been uh, human involvement um, and some of it has been uh, the introduction of um, exotic uh, pests. I think even when the, Ma- uh, the Maori arrived like 900 years or so ago that they brought over rodents with them too, didn't they? Well, that's right, the curi. I think the Polynesian rat was was the uh, uh, an issue. Uh, and I think they brought the curi over, but, and, but I think it was the introduction of the black rat and the ship rat that actually were much bigger than the curi that actually did quite a bit more of the damage. And, but the curi were concerned. And, of course, now they've got possums over there. So they've got upwards of 70 million possums. And the, you see the stories of the... Oh, and, and see the videos of, of, uh, of possums going into the nests of Kokako uh, and taking the chicks and the eggs. Um, so you, you never think of a possum as being carnivorous. But if there's an opportunity to get some protein... Well, they will. Yeah. They will. Yeah, yeah. That's right. People are surprised when they hear about the squirrel gliders. As you know, we have squirrel gliders, and you know they'll eat baby birds and geckos, as well as fruit and nectar. And yeah, things like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, are you at all conflicted? I mean, obviously, I can. I I know you love animals. A lot of people that get into the work that you do obviously have to. And then you know we see possums, the animals over here that you know in a lot of places in the bush they're threatened. Um, you, you see them over there having to be culled for the greater good. Is there a, a, any kind of a conflict there with you at all? No, I, I, I don't have any conflict um, with with particular species if they're out of the wrong... If they're not in the right con- context. If they're out of the, the context that they should be in. You know, I quite like cats. You know, I, I really like foxes. I used to vehemently uh, argue against fox hunting in the UK. 
we've got foxes over here, we've got cats over here, and they damage our wildlife uh, irreparably, you know. And so in the context that they're supposed to be, that's fine. Out of context, uh, and I don't have any issues with the fact that we need to cull and control those animals uh, to help the endemic species, those indigenous species, those, those ones that belong there, to help them. As humanely as possible. Well, yeah, of course, it, 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 we want to do it as humanely as possible. Um, and, you know, there's lots of issues going around about the use of 1080, uh, uh, about people's concern about that. But until there's a better alternative, that's what we, we've got. And that's what we need to be using to try and control... Um, some of these animals, you know, what what's the alternative to sit back and, you know, allow it to happen or have predator-proof fences like the Australian Wildlife Conservancy have, you know, and, uh, you know, a fantastic organisation that are got insurance populations all over Australia by using predator-proof fence, but that's just in a small... Uh, snapshot of of Australia so wouldn't it be ideal if we could get rid of the foxes the cats and any other introduced species rabbits you know deer uh, any of the ones that have come in and get rid of them and then those animals that are our endemic species will then flourish well said mm, absolutely it's a bit of a conflict there isn't it with the with the chemicals and things it's uh it's quite hard to decide what's the better way to go well, I don't think there's a conflict. Mm. I, I, I'm very clear in my mind that until we have a better technique of controlling the introduced species, you know, people talk about caliche virus and myxomatosis that's been used in rabbits to control rabbits, without, that, without which we'd be struggling as a country because we would have, without those diseases, we would have... Well, you know, devastated the, the landscape you know? thankfully we had those diseases and I believe that, um, that if there are some controls that you can put in place yes there's a, more of a concern now about the kind of welfare and the moral and ethics of it but I, I'm of a, an opinion that we have a duty to look after our endemic species more than of what we'd need to be concerned about of controlling uh, the, those species that we've introduced. We've made the mess. We've introduced cane toads. We've introduced, you know, climatisation society. Let's have, bring foxes over for fox hunting. A lot of all, the, all of these sort of things were done without the slightest thought about our endemic species. Uh, and we need to take back what we have in Australia and, and help them support them as much as we possibly can. Very well said. Mm. Yeah, good stuff. Mm. Um, yeah, because we're very lucky over here, the unique wildlife that we have. Oh, extraordinary stuff, you know, like wonderful with, uh, you know, marsupials and monotremes. I would just love to have seen some of the uh, wonderful species that uh, we can only see at the Narracourt Caves in the, the museum there and there. You know, wouldn't it be fantastic to see a diprotodon or a marsupial tapir or a thylaco leo, you know? You imagine a thylaco leo running around or a thylacine, you know? We, we, we've, we've lost a lot of our e ecosystem management as a consequence of losing those species. Yeah, it's very hard to keep your head around. Um, it can sometimes get overwhelming too. Do, do, does your job ever get overwhelming for you? I sometimes feel a bit down at the prospect of you know are, are you doing are you actually doing anything useful you know my as I mentioned before I, I felt my I wanted to dedicate my uh, career to to conservation really and you know you think you know have you done much have you contributed much I'm not sure uh, one of the great things about being a lecturer at university now is having garnered and gathered all these experiences over many many years I can share them 
with the students and also perhaps have an influence on the students in in the direction that they go so so I don't just talk about individual uh, species um, health and management I talk about population management I talk about how we need to look after our environment and what are some of the aspects that are having an effect on our uh, species you know, including climate change and intro introduction of, of different species onto, into the Australian landscape and so I've, I feel very passionate about the, being able to convey some of these ideas uh, to the students and then we, I get the students to do presentations on some of the um, major issues that we've got in, in Australia including you know plastics in the sea and you know shark culling and uh, how to manage uh, endangered species you know, where can we go in terms of trying to control uh, the species that we've introduced as well what all of those sort of uh, interesting kind of topics that are very um, topical at the moment and that I want that the students our students and if I can have an influence in a little way with our students, then hopefully they can take the baton on and do some more useful work in the future. So I, I, I try to get them stirred up, you know, as much as I possibly can. And time will tell where, whether I've stirred them up enough. I wish some of our politicians could come into your classroom and be stirred up. I'd love to. I, I often, I regularly write uh, letters to politicians. I, I, I feel duty bound to actually write a letter and and I, I don't do you hand write it I don't <laughs> <laughs> surprisingly I'm, I'm quite good uh, at typing these days and I, I don't th I, th I think it would be such a novel thing for them to receive a real letter <laughs> maybe I, it might have a better effect but uh, you know I, f I, j I just feel that when there's some glaringly important issues you know, our lack of sort of planning when it comes to climate change at the moment is just maddening and so silly and so short-sighted and I, my, I concern, I'm concerned for my son's generation and the generations that are to come that you know are we going to have uh, places wild places and that are we are we going to be affected so badly by uh, climate change that we're going to really struggle as a as a species, I heard. I, I talked to a, a friend of mine in uh, in South Africa just recently, and he put it quite quite succinctly and said, you know, that the Earth will continue long after humans have gone. If the humans don't get their act together, the humans will, you know, the, the species will implode. We've only been on this on on Earth as a as a species for a few hundred thousand years in, con in the context of the whole time period of the earth you know, a blip in time and if we don't uh, if, if we aren't uh, caring of our earth then you know, we'll just disappear and the earth will survive in a different it will in, it be a different incarnation there won't be humans but there'll be other species that will come along and and the earth will continue, but we won't be here to cause problems. Well, it's like the meteor event of 65 million years ago. We can sit here and go, well, lucky that happened, because now we're here. Um, there might be some new species going, well, lucky they did all that. Yeah. But I wonder whether humans will persist, because we might get thrown back to the Stone Age, but we might exist somewhere. I mean, we've got people living in the polar regions, we've got people living in the, in the arid regions, and we're pretty adaptable, I guess, too. Oh, we we are adaptable, and, that, and that's for sure. And you know, certainly, it's likely that some people will live. But when you're talking over, you know, thousands and possibly millions of years, you know, ultimately, the Earth will be here, yeah, you know, fed by the sun, providing some energy, and there'll be a whole new suite of different species, and humans might be in the dim distant past. Yeah, but but maybe not future generations of humans. They'll they'll, they'll 
miss out on those species that we're losing now, even you know, despite the fact that in millions of years new species will evolve. So it's, it, is, it is sad. I mean, like you say, you can stand back and go, oh, well, everything goes extinct, but it, it's still a shame. I mean, I, I think so. But what we're doing, we, we, you know, the extinction rate is 10,000 times the background extinction rate. Now, we've got clear evidence that the temperature is man-made, and, and yet we have politicians that can't come to terms with the fact that we are causing a lot of these issues and we need to reverse it before it's too late, even for the next generation or two. And it seems like most people you speak to are pretty reasonable and kind of understand that. But there's such a big divide between what scientists say and what the average punter wants and what politicians do. Is that a financial reason there somewhere? Oh, I'm sure there's some sort of backhandedness going on. <laughs> um, but it, 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 I cannot understand how... Uh, our politicians cannot listen uh, and to the scientists unless there is some sort of vested interest. It defies logic that politicians are behaving in the way they are um, unless there is some sort of something else in the background. You know, the logic tells you this is happening, and we need to do this. And all they can think about is the short-term gain of perhaps using, you know, new coal-fired power stations you know, watching um, TV last night, you know, the idea of using nuclear power you know, no, no one's it's too scary to even think about using nuclear power our laws of the land um, say that it's illegal to have nuclear power in Australia but perhaps that might be the best way in the future of uh, providing the energy that we need at a, a cheap um, cheap cost it's the bloody Simpsons that have ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, earlier this year, Steve and I went to Borneo and we were lucky enough to see wild orangutans. And, I mean, Steve's seen them before and I, I was pretty blown away. And I thought, gee, that'd be, that's pretty awesome. It'd be pretty amazing to go and see gorillas. Gorillas are a pretty phenomenal-looking that, animal. That would be, yeah. Maybe the next trip. But you told me today that you've seen... And worked with gorillas. I have, yeah. I've been incredibly lucky. I I uh, lived in Uganda for two and a half years um, between 1999 and 2002, uh, and I was pretty well. I, I was. I went over there to help. Um, I, I was volunteered. I decided that I wanted to try and help and do some do some stuff you know and uh, so I went over to Uganda to help uh, train some of the uh, veterinarians and, and work in a chimpanzee conservation program for the Jane Goodall Institute uh, there was a lot of chimpanzees that were uh, coming in on a regular basis um, that were youngsters that were part or, or uh, leftovers from the bushmeat trade so when uh, they would go in uh, poachers would go in and kill chimpanzees they would save and spare the the youngsters and then try to sell them as pets you know and then they were confiscated brought into Entebbe and then ultimately onto an island uh, Ngamba Island in Lake Victoria and so I was involved in, in a lot of that and uh, flew to Queen Elizabeth National Park to pick up a, a chimpanzee that was found that was brought was being Tried to, tried to be sold in Uganda, brought across from Congo. Hi, birds. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was tethered to a pole, and we had to inject it. And we put it on the plane, anaesthetised it, put it on the plane, and flew back down to Entebbe with this uh, uh, baby chimpanzee called called Kalema, uh, ultimately. And so that then, so that was happening all the time when we were there, and we. And so those those um, chimpanzees had to be hand raised, and so my girlfriend, my wife now, came over. And she's great at hand raising animals, and so she was involved in hand raising, you know, part hand raising ba twelve baby uh, orphan chimpanzees that were, you know, psychologically pretty badly disturbed because you know their family had been killed around them, and they were just left on the run. So we provided them with as much attention and care as we possibly could and then ultimately put them on a 
an island as a big group. So the Ungambra Island's still going now. In fact, it's celebrating its 20 year anniversary this week. Unfortunately, we couldn't get over there to go and celebrate with them. But uh, those those chimps, you know, met Jane, Jane Goodall. She came over a couple of times. In fact, um, she got injured, and I carried her out of the uh, the chimp area because she <laughs> she got um, jumped on by a chimpanzee and uh, actually broke her foot. Uh, oh. So I had to carry her out. Uh, but but that's another story. Um, but whilst whilst I was there, um, I got an opportunity to go and see the gorillas. Um, so on the first of the first two thousand, so the Y two bug was about to cause havoc <laughs> all around the world. I happened to be in Mugahinga National Park. I thought, well, a good place to be. No, hurry just... up! Hurry up! <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Great great place to be. So right on the border between Congo, Rwanda, and Uganda but just in Uganda. So I went down to see the, the uh, gorillas for the mountain gorillas for, for New Year. And uh, we, they were, they were in Congo. And then also on the, so I arrived on the couple of days before we had to wait. And then on the first of the first, they moved across from Congo into Uganda. So literally 200 meters across the border. <laughs> so we could go and visit them. So, I was the first person in this millennium. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds ridiculously silly, but uh, to, to actually see the mountain gorillas in, in Mugahinga National Park. So that was the first time, and I paid to go and see them. And then subsequently, uh, I got an opportunity to go and treat a uh, mountain gorilla uh, in, well, in Windy Na in Penetrable National Park, but also in Mount Visoki uh, in Rwanda. So the veterinarians were away uh, when there was a sick uh, mountain gorilla so uh, Liz Williamson from the International Gorilla uh, Conservation uh, Fund contacted me and said we've got a sick, a sick gorilla and it was part of Diane Fossey's uh, research group so they weren't a um, tourist group they were they were a, 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 just a research group and um, and she said, can you come over from Entebbe? So it was about a nine-hour drive to the, the, the border. Uh, uh, I said, yeah, I'll be there uh, to help out, you know. And uh, so we went, when we got into uh, uh, Rwanda, uh, um, you know, you go down these terrible roads in, in Uganda, and then you go across the border into uh, Rwanda, and they've got these beautiful tar-sealed roads. So this was nine, this was 2000. 2000, September 2000. Uh, I remember it because um, my wife had tickets to the uh, equestrian event at the Olymp Olympic Games in Sydney, and she, you know, I uh, have these tickets to go to this. <laughs> and she was in uh, in Uganda and Rwanda, so you know, we kind of realised that actually going to see the mountain gorillas was was a very special thing, even though the uh, Sydney Olympics was. Uh, a fantastic event so we went over and we had to go and check them so you know I couldn't believe that I was climbing up Mount Visoki uh, where Diane Fossey had uh, kind of worked and uh, had to check how one of these gorillas was it was name was uh, Amahoro uh, and it was part of this group and it was a you know a young silverback so it was about 13 or 14 so there was a few males in that group and there's a big big silverback uh, and so we went into this uh, you know, tried to find them and we we got to see them and they I kind of got this feeling that they didn't really like my presence because I'm tall for one thing but also I was new to them and all these other guys uh, were uh, kind of you know very, they were familiar so I, I checked this um, this gorilla and it was clearly not eating. Looked like it had a bit of a nasal discharge. It was breathing quite heavily, and it had been going on for a few days. Are you, sorry, did, you're watching this through binoculars. Yeah, so I was looking with binoculars with these other guys with me, the researchers with me, and they wanted, you know, I was trying to assess what was going on, you know, if we could do anything. So we kept looking we'd follow them they'd wander off and this this Amahara was not eating at all looking you know relatively gaunt in comparison to its other mates but 
its brothers would be cajoling it and pushing it along come on keep going keep going gotta we've got to keep going and looking for food um, and then at one particular s- stage we I was looking they had a, a little youngster wandering around and that, that little youngster came quite close to me and I was still looking with the binoculars and I was thinking oh, that's quite interesting he shouldn't really come too close to me really and then suddenly out of, out of nowhere the silverback charged me and I was thinking you know I knew he, he just made the noise beat his chest ran full tilt towards me and I thought you know what I've learnt in my life um, what do I do get as low as I possibly can so I got down as low as I could and I had there was a little tree <laughs> about three foot tall tried to hide behind this uh, little tree uh, obviously having no effect whatsoever so I just got down as low as I possibly could and he, he, and he stood over me uh, for about it seemed like about an hour but it was probably about 30 seconds and you know it, its teeth were you know 20 centimetres away from me I could, I could smell its breath <laughs> and I, I, was, I was there and I, I looked around well eventually he just sauntered off and went you know he'd proved he'd proven to me that he was the boss and you know just to make sure you're okay looked around and all, all my research, the, the researchers that I was with weren't there <laughs> and they're not supposed to leave a new person they, they'd wandered off you know and I, so like you know, my heart was pounding, thinking, <laughs> you know, do I want, to, do I want this gig, or do I should I go back to Entebbe? Um But you know, it was all part of the, the fantastic experience. And so, we we continued to look at this male that was sick, uh, and then we just, you know, we'd, we'd seen what we needed to see, and I went back. We all went back down. Uh, I had a, a conversation with the vets in America. They were over there at a conference decided they'd all leave to go to a conference uh, with a, uh, uh, you know, the opportunity for animals to get sick. I, I suggested that we would anaesthetise it because uh, I'd anaesthetised gorillas in zoos before but they weren't really keen on the idea of someone that they didn't know anaesthetising one of their gorillas. That would make them look really, really bad if, if the animal had died, of course. Uh, so we decided to treat it um, blindly in a way with antibiotics so I had a feeling that there was a respiratory infection going on so the next day we went up and it was interesting after that uh, silverback had given me a a bit of a once over the day before that uh, he was relatively calm with me the second day you know he kind of proved his point so I I was decided I was going to to treat this and I I made a plan uh, a treatment plan so I had to get into a position to be able to dart this uh, gorilla Amahoro. And I was joined by one of the guys, uh, one of the rangers called Matthias, who's a big uh, Rwandan guy, big, deep voiced, massive f- physique. You know, he was there to look after me. The other guy that I went with the day, be- day before was a guy called Fundy, and he was smaller, bespectacled, and Matthias was there to, to protect me in case the. Uh, gorillas turned on me and he was a hell of a nice bloke so is the plan at this point to shoot antibiotics into the animal yeah yeah that was the plan so so we you know thinking you know, i know a little bit about pharmacology and a little bit about drugs and what, what was available you know there was only certain things that were available so and i knew i had to dart it twice to get the volume in and the types <laughs> of drugs so so i <laughs> And we had to have a small pistol, um, which went in a, a bum bag, uh, uh, which I carried, and then the the, the barrel went down my g- gum boots on the inside of my gum boots. So I went there. You know, you couldn't walk around with a dart rifle, or else they'd run a mile. So you had to be very very discreet. And so we got into a position where there was this beautiful uh, backside uh, looking at me about <laughs> 10 metres away and Matthias said this is a chance so got this one, pinged it into its bottom and it ran forward you know you could almost imagine ah oh, what the 
hell was that? What the hell? <laughs> so it, it, it ran forward, but I still had to get another injection into it. And so then we got, we had to re- find it again, and we eventually found it, and we could see uh, through the bushes that it was sitting on its back, uh, scratching its back sideways, and, and I could just see a little bit of thigh. So I crawled on, under the, the foliage and got into a position. I hit it again on the inside of the leg. And, <laughs> oh, it screamed off again. Oh, t- tremendous commotion. But uh, fortunately, all the other gorillas were away, you know, eating elsewhere. It's very thick and dense there. So uh, it ran off, and then we'd done the job. And the, the rangers were just over the moon that the fact that I'd come to treat this animal. They were ch- slapping me on the back. And we took a photo. And, <laughs> and then we saw Amahoro with its mum, Pandora. So this was a 14-year-old, uh, nearly silverback gorilla, wanting to get solace from its mum, Pandora. And Pandora was in Diane Fossey's book, Gorillas in the Mist. So it was, she, it, Pandora was a young animal in the, when she wrote Gorillas in the Mist. Uh, and so there was that connection. She had a bit of a dodgy eye, and, uh, and, she, and, and this Amahara was trying to get, um, you know, help me, someone keeps biting me or stinging me or something. <laughs> no, I don't know what's going on. Anyway, uh, we finished. We were very happy. We won- wandered back down to the, the camp where we were staying, and then I went back to Entebbe. And, you know, we heard a few days later that uh, he really it started to pick up after a couple of days and, and went on and he was fine. And so I kind of was really t- delighted and tickled pink that our intervention had contributed him to, it contributed into him recovering. Uh, you know, at that time there was about 600 mountain gorillas. So he was, he was you know, potentially a an important animal, you know, and I was delighted that I could take part in what was a, an amazing experience. And a very Ooh. risky experience too, yeah. Oh, well, it was. Great job. <laughs> it was, it was, particularly that first day, uh, it was a kind of frightening experience, but, mm. but you know, who gets, who gets a chance to be in that sort of situation? A, to be charged, B, Diane Fossey's uh, research mounting gorillas and then to be able to treat them and with a successful outcome was amazing. That is amazing. Some of the places where you go, I mean, obviously it's not really an issue here in Australia, but I mean, some of these places where there are endangered animals are war torn, you've got all these other outside factors going against you before you even see an animal. And you would have had that with the gorillas as well. Oh, that would have been pretty dangerous. It, very much so. The, the, the year I went to. Uh, to Uganda in 1999 in the early part of 1999 there were some tourists that were were uh, kidnapped by some of the militia in Uganda rather than Rwanda where I was with, with those animals but that, those militia called Intrahamwe would move in those areas very much all the time and often would kill uh, mountain gorillas uh, but you know, they, they were always a, a kind of concern. You know, Congo has had untold misery uh, for the past, you know, 20 years or so. You know, millions of people have died, in, and a lot of it's to do with some of those militia people that live in the, that, the Virunga Mountains area. But there was, a, there was a sad note that about 12 months later, I, I got on really well with uh, Fundy and... Uh, and Matthias, the guy who was protecting me on the day that we were dieting the animal, and I got a, a call from Liz Williamson 12, about 12 months later that Matthias had actually been shot dead um, protecting the mountain gorillas. He'd gone up, as he did every day, to look at the mountain gorillas to find out where they were, to make sure they were okay, spotted uh, militia, and he was about, you know, it was all about shoot on sight, you know, and they got him before he got them, you know. And you think what Matthias had gone through, uh, you know, and he'd lost his wife in the genocide in 1994, you know, his wife was shot in the paddock with a child on his on her back, and he'd gone through all that 
hell on earth in 1994 uh, was a ranger and then you know he was passionate about looking after his mountain gorillas and then you know he took a took a bullet so those those guys in those areas protecting those animals are amazing you know that we we need to support them as much as we possibly can and I was terribly upset about you know, to me he was a conservation warrior you know and he'd lost his life would I do that probably not you know but he he did that and we don't recognize these guys as much as we should for what they do and you did do that you put yourself at risk as well so yeah well, yeah, for, yeah, but it's n- nothing like, you know, I, I had I had my, t- my tires looking after my back, you know. Mm. I, I, it was a, bit, a big, exciting ex- experience for me, but, you know, he he lived that every day, mm. you know, and he'd been through hell and back, as most Rwandans had during that sort of genocide period and post, post-genocide period, yeah. It's incredible when you consider that these guys, with all those factors, still take the time to conserve another animal. Oh, I know. It's amazing. It's am- it is amazing, and... There's a lot of very passionate people um, uh, in those areas, you know, that are doing the right thing, you know. In Congo, it, it's it's not beyond um, for people to actually eat bush meat, you know, to eat a lot of, uh, particularly apes, you know, and, and they will eat in, in chimpanzees, uh, gorillas and so on. In Uganda, though, Ugandans think of chimpanzees and gorillas as cousins you know they don't they they would never think about eating uh, an animal so it's different cultures different sorts of situations different people uh, and how they're reacting to what we have you know the 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 wildlife that we have in uh, our countries you know i think in the congo they don't even consider pygmies to be people well often you know you know one of the one of the amazing things that we we did when we were in Mugahinga National Park, which is in Uganda, which is a, a mountain gorilla park, um, they, the Batwa, uh, which are the, the local people, the pygmy people from that area, were pushed off that uh, land. Now, we befriended a guy called uh, Sheba, who was a, a local guy from Kisoro, and he came over to Taronga Zoo when I was working there. Um, to he was a, he, He's a really... Um, sort of passionate community oriented person passionate about the conservation of animals but also about helping people in the uh, local community and uh, he contacted us and said you know it'd be really nice to do something for these Batwa uh, people so I contacted Katrina um, my girlfriend my wife now uh, back in Sydney before she came over and said can you can you try and raise a bit of money to to try and help these guys so she raised you know three hundred dollars not much really but she brought it over because it didn't have much time brought it over and we went and bought some second-hand clothes and bought a whole pile of food and these batois were just desperately desperately poor absolutely the poorest of poor and disenfranchised from because they were hunter-gatherers that lived on Mugahinga national park in that area and just had nothing just second class citizens and so we went over and, and it was just a small gesture and we, we got some clothes and, and to see them fighting over items of clothes and uh, some food just humbled us they danced for us and they, they brought out this millet uh, drink millet beer and you know it has to go around everybody. And you know, I thought, I'm not really sure I want to do this, but, <laughs> but you kind of felt obliged to do it. And you take a sip from the same bowl, <laughs> uh, and it, was, it tasted disgusting. But it was, <laughs> and they danced for us, and you know they didn't have any, you know, water. They didn't clean. They didn't have any clothes, and so we just provided them with a little bit, you know. And I just thought, wouldn't it be fantastic to help these poor? people that have been you know set aside because of the gorillas you know and there's always this kind of issue that the mountain gorillas are close by to 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 humans you know the the local people are trying to make a living you know they're trying to grow crops and the gorillas are coming in stealing their crops and then the they come in contact with some of the diseases that humans have so often the 
gorillas would get mange from the people who had mange. So they live in such steep terrain. The only water is at the bottom of the valley and it's a long way down there and then you've got to haul that water up there so they don't tend to wash as often and it's quite cool in sometimes uh, in uh, some times of the year so these are kind of reluctant to wash and hence they get skin diseases hence they get mange and that was then passed on to the the gorillas as well so there's this kind of interesting interaction that occurs you know between people some people get really badly disenfranchised but then we think, well, we've only got 600, 650 mountain gorillas. But there's also the need to look after the people as well at the same time. We've, we've, had, we've said it many times on this show um, about human overpopulation, massive issue. We had Dr James Ward um, from Sustainable Populations Australia, yep. I think it's called. Um, any thoughts? It's the biggest um, issue in the world and we need to tackle it at some stage but it seems like it's a, a, a hot potato too big a hot potato to actually discuss uh, openly and you know a lot of people and I, I subscribe to this is that yeah educate women and women will make better decisions rather than having them f those decisions forced upon them uh, and the availability of you know contraception and education at the same time is is the only real way forward um, uh, and you know Uganda's population has massively increased it, it's, it's quite a, you know, a clean green country you know the things grow you don't have famines in, in Uganda but the same in Kenya you know the population's massively increased in Kenya Tanzania Uganda and Hey, hey. it's not going to be sustainable it's the same in lots of other countries you know so it's a big 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 topic to try and unpack that one it is I, you, the only person I've seen really come out too much and say it I mean apart from Dick Smith with a few ads um, David Attenborough he comes out and he, he seems to get away with it but it's, it's possibly easier to control in somewhere like England or Australia but Uganda and places like that it would be so hard to get that education well, out there wouldn't it uh, well it uh, and it is i mean it, it's all a matter of um, you know the western developed countries actually helping and supporting them to provide education you, they, they have universal education in uganda till primary school but then afterwards what do you do then you know um and a lot of the young girls um have to go and work in the fields you know to try and get some food for for the family you know and it's it's a, a situation that goes round and round and round in circles and you know unless we are going to help uh, them have better education support for women to make the decisions that they want to make then we're we, we're going to be having the same continuous problems for the next generation or two You've told us some fascinating stories, some, some heart-wrenching stories. Do you remain optimistic? I do. You have to be. You have to be optimistic. And I, you know, how... I'm optimistic because I think the younger generation, my son's generation, and the generation of students that I'm teaching are feeling that we need to take control, you know? I sort of noted with great interest when Bernie Sanders was running uh, for the Democrats in America how my thoughts very much aligned with Bernie Sanders and a lot of youngsters thoughts aligned with Bernie Sanders as well and unfortunately he didn't get to, to run against Trump because I think he would have been a completely different kettle of fish and I think probably Bernie Sanders would be in there and he is the the optimist we have to take back control we've got to be progressive we've got to think about um, how we manage our environment and I'm optimistic that this generation future generations will realize that we have to do something we have to reverse some of the trends that are occurring and that includes population uh, 
po controlling po uh, human population, but but managing our environment and looking after it on the best as we can. You know. I agree. I'm quite excited about the next generations coming through because I, I really do think that education is working and people are accepting a bit more that we need to change what we're doing. Yeah, and you 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 see that they're going to start not accepting the old political dogma, mm. the old way of doing things. They, my son the other day said to me, um, do I have to do biology to be an environmentalist? At, you know, studying at school, and I thought about it for a second, and I thought, actually, you probably need to do a bit of science. It's not particularly science-oriented, but, but then I thought about it, and actually, it's about communication. It's about... You don't have to. It's nice to have the, some facts and so on, and you can learn, you can find those facts. But actually, to you need people to stand up and to talk and communicate about what we need to do and why we need to do it. I think so. I think do what you do best and be an environmentalist. And if if you earn money, that's the thing you do. You're an economist. Do that and be an environmentalist. If you're a politically minded person, do that and be an environmentalist. Uh, absolutely, and I think you know, we should all be environmentalists and we should all be you know, being responsible uh, and sustain living sustainably as much as we possibly can. And it's just a, a paradigm shift that we have to think about the, to move away from some of the old standard ways of doing things, you know. Why can't we get electric cars? Why can't we have more solar uh, power you know, why can't we even dare I say it have nuclear power you know all those sort of things that need to be put on the table and discussed in a frank and open way with so science supporting it science supporting everything we, I'm totally about evidence based uh, science you know evidence is everything you know and we have to we have to go forward Fantastic. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Mate, that's, that was fantastic. That was brilliant. I, I loved that. I don't know if we can add anything to that. I, that I, was a really good message to take out on, I think. <laughs> um, a bit speechless on that last message. Yeah, that's great. yeah, that was really well said. Mate, did you want to add anything there um, to, to any of that? I, I honestly don't think you need to. <laughs> but that was No, I think that's probably a good way to end it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can do the editing at the end of it. I yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I, like no point in over That's beautiful. It. I want to see you do a TED Talk, mate. I think um, that was the prelude to a TED Talk. Yeah, oh, that, yeah. yeah, I don't know whether I'm uh, at that sort of level, but it's nice to be able to, um, you know, talk about some things that I'm passionate about. I mate. could sit and listen to you for hours. Thanks, Dee. That's very Definitely. Nice. Yeah. Apart from your northern accent. <laughs> Don't start talking about soccer. Yeah, no. Don't start talking about soccer. Yeah. Um, mate, thanks so much for coming on. Thank that was you. amazing. Thanks. Thanks, thanks very so much. much. It's been yeah. nice to be able to have a chat with you. And thanks for listening. <laughs>